So, good evening, everybody. I just want to ask a question. How many of you trust his physician? Can we see hands? And if any of you get sick, God forbid, how many of you will Google it before he goes and see the doctor? So the lit recent literature say that 34% uh, only trust their physicians of the people. Interestingly, in the Western world, 90% of the people will Google their signs and symptoms prior to go and see their physician. And that's where the missing link is. In 1999, I went to Canada to McGill University to study orthopedic surgery. And in January 2000, when I was on call at night, covering orthopedic surgery, plastic surgery, and cardiac surgery, which is a weird combination, but we have to do it during our night duties and shift. I've been called to come to the operating room of cardiac surgery. Now, cardiac surgery, in a place where I was studying my medical school, we were forbidden from going into the operating room. It's a closed box, nobody knows what's going on, highly sophisticated, fancy speciality. I go to the operating room and the lady surgeon looked at me and she said, take the vein for me. And I said, from where? Because I don't know, I've never taken a vein for somebody. So she stopped for five minutes, she come down, she showed me how to take the vein, she goes back to the chest and she said, oh, you know how to do it, just complete it. So, there are things that change the human being life, but what I understand is that there are three major elements that I learned in cardiac surgery, which we ultimately look at it in real life. And the three major elements that we have to think of is the team, building the team. Second thing is the work devotion and integrity. And the third important concept is the human to human relationship that will make us successful. So, we all know that the society is made up of families, and the family is the nucleus of any society. And many of us think of the family, blood family, which is absolutely not the way we should look at things. When you look at family, there is a blood family, there are family at work, they are family where you spend time with them. They are family whom you travel with. They are family whom you produce your research with. And so you don't limit the concept of family to a certain areas. And we're going to concentrate on the work, the family of work, the team that you team up with and work with. How are you going to choose them? What's the selection criteria for your team? How are you going to work with them? How are you going to motivate them? How are you going to to bring them together in order to see the overall vision. Because you have to have a common vision. If you have a patient who's lying on the table, whose family is waiting for you outside, they would like to see that patient alive, walking, going back to normal life. So you do, so your team do. They have to believe the concept that yes, all of us are here for one ultimate aim is to improve the health of this patient and to bring him back to real life. This is what happens when we go and work in any other organization. What's your ultimate aim? Is to serve people, is to do the right things, and to do the right things for yourself and to do the right things for the society. Because you are part of the society, and if you are part of the society, that society have to have the right privileges and services that you are asked to do it. So the team have to have a common goal. All of you have to have a common goal. Each one of the team have to complement each other. And if you can see in this view, you can see that there is the anesthetist that is working there, the surgeon, the assistant surgeon, the nurse who's helping you circulating, the nurse who's helping you scrub, and the perfusionist, and all of those people are working in harmony. And if anybody is not doing his job, then the outcome is going to be defective. It's not going to work the right way. And it's not going to be ultimately 
uh, doing the right things. This is something that we have to convince ourselves and we have to convince our team. I work in the other organization, I carry many hats, and the other organization I ask my finance guy one day in the morning, why do you come to work? And the answer, he said, in order to give salaries, he was from the finance department, to give salaries to the staff. Now, he is missing the point, why does he come to work? He works in an organization, a health organization, where they promote medical education in preparing physicians for the future, for the community. But he is looking in what he does. He's not looking into why he exists. Why does he come to work? So what we try to do is that we try to teach people is that you are here to promote health care, to bring the best physicians so you will have a better health care system in this society. You are not here to do literally the work. People, the coordinators, the finance people, the admin people, the people who are helping you, the drivers, the cleaners are not there just to do the job they've been given the title. They have to look into the overall concepts and overall interest. Denton Cooley is one of the great surgeons and he passed away last year. He's from Texas Heart Institute in Texas. A great guy, he's one of the founders of cardiac surgery. When he used to do his rounds, until the age of 90s, he does his rounds and I met him doing his rounds. He would turn around after the round and he will say thank you to the nurse, thank you to the medical student, thank you to the cleaner. What he does, he realizes that if he doesn't say thank you to every single person, and if he doesn't ask about every single person in the team, for example, the cleaner, his patient will land up with mediastinitis. And he knows for sure that mediastinitis will carry a 50% risk of mortality. And that will affect the reason why he comes and operates on those patients. And hence, he have to take care of everybody so they can take care of his team. Work, devotion, and integrity. Devotion and integrity at work is very important for us. When the patient come to you, when a client come to you in your company, he comes for a specific reason. He wanted to be done and he wanted to be done from the first time. What I learned in cardiac surgery, when we do our open heart surgeries, we do it in a very high precision. And we have to do it in a very organized manner because it has to be systematic. And we have to aim for a specific outcome. And the reason why we need to aim for a specific outcome is very simple. Because that outcome is what he is going to live with. That person who came to you, to the operating room, or who came to you in your company seeking for an advice, seeking for help, seeking for a service, he have other things to do as well. Ultimately, these people who comes to you, they wanted the best. So you wanted the best when you go to their institute or their organizations. You have to count to yourself that you have only one shot and you have to do it right. We do stop the heart when we operate and doing coronary artery bypass or replacing the valves. And we know that there is always a chance that that heart might not work ever again. But we keep the hope that it will work because that's the norm for us if we do the right job. So precision will control your outcome and that's how you, people will come back to you. And this is an ultimate need for all of us, is that we do things the right way. We don't come to work and we say, well, if X, Y, Z is not doing his job, why should I do his job? Because at the end of the day, I'm getting the same salary or the same pay. It will pay off ultimately for you. And the reason why it will pay off, because people who go the extra mile will ultimately do better with no doubts. All of us like to go to the top of the pyramid. That is something that every single person wants to do that. And they think that's a success. Other people want to go into the top of the pyramid and stay at the top of the pyramid because they think that's a success. And from our experience in cardiac surgery, that's not the success. You have to move from one success to another because that's very important to us. A simple example, when we opened the cardiac surgery unit in the Sultan Qaboos University Hospital, in 2008, we've done the first thoracab in the Middle East, doing multiple incisions and the thoracic incisions. 
uh, multiple grafts uh, bypass. That was a break news. People come to us, they started trusting us. We don't stop. We didn't think that is the ultimate aim for us. We continue to do a lot of successes. 2013, we brought the TAVI, transfemoral aortic valve implantation in the country. And that was another success for us. We didn't stop there. In 2014, we were called for a 26 years old man who's lying in the CCU for three months and he can't move in heart failure and he needed a mechanical heart. We've never done a mechanical heart in this country, but he needed to be done something for him. We go, we learn and we do it and we do it the right way and we take the risk for doing it and we don't get the punished if we take the risk, if we do it for the right reason, because there's an ultimate reason that we wanted to do it. Comes 2015, pregnant woman, need double valve, valve and valve, never been heard about it. You call the inventor of that valve and he said, well, theoretically, it's feasible, but nobody ever have done it. Would you do it? I call the other gentleman who have trained me how to do the TAVI program. He said, when are you doing it? I'm coming to join you in that case. So it tells you there is a risk that you have to take regardless. There might be something coming in in 2018, you never know. So when you have the right team who have the right devotion, and this is uh, Walsh, uh, who was the CEO of, uh, of uh, General Electric have, have talked about uh, certain areas how companies try to attract their own people and I convert it into how, what do we need? What do we need our team members ultimately to be? One of the things is that we need to have a real commitment to continue learning. We don't want them to be stagnant. We don't want them to have the 1950 knowledge. And that's going to come later on. I'm going to talk about it. PM promotion is definitely something that everybody loves in this room. Who doesn't love PM promotions here? Okay, no single hand. So it tells you how important it is. So you attract the right team with the PM promotion, but I have to tell you something. You have to have a rigorous appraisal system where you have the right to hire and to fire. The minute you lose the concepts of hiring and firing, you lose the concepts of innovation, creativity that comes with it, the initiatives the keenness of inventing new things, to bring new things to the whole society. The society deserves to be treated better. Allow them to take the risk, celebrate those who do, no matter what is the outcome, even if they lose it. What if they lose the outcome? If they fail, failure's never been a stagnant thing. Let them change, let them try things new, and let them bring in new ideas, new concepts. Let them come a long way to bring the new ideas to you so that you move forward with the new technologies, with the new ideas. Let them understand what is good for the society is good for the business because society always will chase the right things. And if it is good, then you will be doing a good business. People come to you, patients come to you, clients come to you in your company. Keep the selection standard high. Don't lower the selection standards just because I know X or I know Y. That will make you avoid all the people that you don't want them to be in your team. And if you standardize that concept and you maintain that high standards, then you will ultimately be successful and your team will be successful. But there's no shortcuts that you should do with this. And of course, you keep your organization growing. The day that you do 100 cases next year, you need to do 200 cases and the year after needs to do 300 cases. You had the team and you had the devotion. What is missing still? What is missing is the human to human relationship. You might be listening to some people talking about the disruptive technology that is coming. How many of you have the Fitbit in their hands here? Okay, here you go. This is all big data analysis that everybody is collecting it every time you hook it to your laptop in the evenings and you hook it to the Wi-Fi. People talk about artificial intelligence. Maybe other people will be more experienced than me. People talk about the blockchain and today I came to know about something else that is even a newer platform for technology. All of these are coming. So what happened with all of this? Apple, Google, 
all these companies are coming up with all these apps that they think that going to replace the physician and they're going to replace the humans and everything is going to be done remotely from your home. You will put your signs and symptoms and it will come up with a diagnosis, with a treatment plan. I don't think, I know one of the companies are putting around $200 billion for that because they think in the next five years, the whole healthcare system with the disruptive technology is going to change. And I believe it will change, but it will never get rid of the human touch. And the reason why, because we do need the human touch no matter what we do in this life. I'm sure in the next five years, somebody will bring up the, his phone and he will scan his tummy and he will see it like an MRI or a CT scan. I'm sure they will swallow a pill and they will check his intestines and they will come up with a diagnosis on the spot. But the society learn. As I said to you, 90% of people will consult Google before they go to their physician. So the physicians have to learn. And if the physicians have to learn, they have to do it the right way. And they have to be competitive. And they have to know what is the market. We have to empower our team. We have to empower our client. They are not stupid. They know everything. And we have, they have to share what we do. And we have to treat the same disease in two different patients with different ways because every patient have his own way of looking at things. Every patient will have his own way of treating things. Everybody have a different maneuvers. Everybody have a different touch. Somebody is more obese, somebody is more skinny, somebody have a family some who have a problems. So we have to personalize medicine at this stage and build a trust with your physician, with your patients. Build a trust with your clients. That is very important. Be humble and tolerant because that's something that is of no doubts is going to build you up and build your skills and knowledge. Trust that patient who comes to you, giving you the trust. I have a girl who flew out to, from out West Alberta for an open heart surgery and when she came to us, we did surgery and, she and the surgery succeeded. The daughter comes to us, her sister comes to us who's three years old and she said, thank you for saving my, child, my sister's life. That is something that you value. And small notes about the past in your files will definitely remind you about what ha that patient have. If you put a small note that he have a child, a new child and the name of the child, when the patient come to you and you mention the name of the child, he will realize that that is very personal to you and that will be something of a difference to you. So please, the human touch have to stay no matter what disruptive technology is going to bring to us and we have to keep that in mind. Thank you very much.